Okay, guys, so I think I'm going to start. Uh, just uh, there will be a few people wandering in at the moment, but uh, we'll get cracking into it since we've got a lot to cover. Uh, so my name is uh, Joshua, and I'm uh, doing my postgrad uh, in the department. I specialise in Italian Renaissance history, the intellectual origins of empire, uh, and uh, sort of spatial histories, more specifically, looking at lots of maps. Uh, so I wrote my honours thesis a few years ago on the gallery of maps in the Vatican, which you might know. Uh, you might have walked through that before. Uh, so today we're going to do a bit of an intellectual history, which means we're, we're looking at the history of ideas, of concepts, of arguments. So there'll be less of the sort of um, the sort of the, the economic facts that you that you heard in um, Mike's lecture, uh, and I'll be talking less about the sort of uh, the, the actual processes of colonization and really the um, uh, the intellectual environment in which uh, the first expeditions were uh, launched and um, uh, the, the first uh, sort of uh, pamphlets arguing in favour of colonies and trading uh, enterprises uh, were created. So. Um, I, I realised that in making the, uh, the PowerPoint, I have a, like a, quite a large screen and that the writing might be a little bit small on this screen. So <laughs> if you can't see uh, the quotes uh, that well, that's okay. I'll try and like say, say them uh, slowly so that you can uh, uh, sort of enjoy the uh, verbose la language of Elizabethan nationalists back in the uh, uh, sort of, uh, 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, so I'm going to start with a, a quite verbose quote. Um, but it's, uh, it kind of sums up uh, the situation uh, that England found itself in, or English uh, sort of thinkers thought they found themselves in, in the uh, 16th century. So here we go. It was written by Robert Johnson in the tract called Nova Britannia in 1609. He says, How strange a thing is this, that all the states of Europe have been asleep so long, that for a hundred years and more the wealth and riches of the East and the West should flow no other current but into one coffer. Seeing our provocations are so many, our cause and our title good, avant all idle oracles that seek to bar us. The wisdom of the wisest saith in these cases, whatsoever thy hand shall find to do, do it with all thy might. So this, what this means will make sense as we go through the lecture. Uh, when he's talking about the riches of the East and the West flowing into one coffer, he's really talking about the Spanish Empire, which at this point had uh, sort of merged with the Portuguese Empire. So through your um, uh, sort of uh, uh, going through the textbook and your lectures, would have learned a little bit about Spanish history already, I'm gathering. Is that, is that correct? You've done a little bit about Spain? I, I will be going through uh, the sort of history of the Spanish Empire just uh, sort of briefly in sort of uh, to paint this con context. Um, but I just want to start with a you know, uh, uh, sort of ease us into uh, the, the, this fundamental question about colonization as a concept, as a, as a historical phenomenon. Uh, so, I mean, uh, Australia, where we are right now, is about as far away from England as you could possibly get, right? Uh, we, yet we speak English, um, we maintain English institutions and forms of government, uh, and even our university was built both in its intended purpose and it's in, build, in its buildings. Uh, as a monument to the British Empire, right? The Gothic forms recalling the romanticised Anglo-Saxon root of King Arthur himself. Uh, so growing up in Sydney, I know uh, that I have always asked the question, why? How can we explain all this? How can we explain that this reproduction of Europe exists here? Um, so of course we can delve into the specifics and we kind of, we all think, you know, we know the specifics. I mean, in the Australian context, uh, uh, you know, the British in the late 18th century had lost their American colonies and needed a new place for convicts um, from overflowing pr prisons. And this was a convenient sort of place to put them, uh, to colonise the land, to keep the French out. Uh, the Fr France, French have their eyes on, the, uh, on Australia, of course. But in de debating these specifics, there are some major and indeed fundamental assumptions about the nature of human civilizations that are often glossed over. Uh, indeed, there is an assumption that to build an empire, to colonise in the way that Europeans did over the last 500 years, is in some way natural. That the violent conquest of the world was, is the sort of natural path of all human communities. Um, obviously, I would argue this is something which is strongly challenged. Uh, but you might notice that this is sort of implicitly one of the assumptions that your textbook often makes, right? So that in seeking to de-Europeanize the story of the making of the modern, interconnected global world, it assumes the rise of a global world, right? 
uh, the rise of a sort of uh, a, of global empires. It assumes that the capitalist market-oriented technological world or that was the natural outcome of all uh, possible human history. So that it was just a series of accidents and contingencies that enabled Europeans to get there first instead of positing uh, that um, uh, perhaps different societies, different cultures uh, had different political and social priorities. Right? It reinforces European ideas about the world and then makes them universal. Uh, so that's my sort of take on, on the textbook, uh, though, I mean, there, there are benefits to it. Uh, you know, it is in considering this dilemma, though, I argue that the, the California school, their sort of motives are, are good in trying to elevate non-European histories. Um, but it is, in fact, impossible to understand the modern world without understanding how Europe conquered and plundered it over the last 500 years. And while comparing the economic fundamentals and potentials of Europe and China and Europe and India, for example, is useful to an extent, for the most part, it misses the point. It fails to explain why things happened in the way they did and does not accept that human beings are not rational creatures that act in the same way given the same circumstances. Uh, so um, generations of historians have uh, pursued the nature of European colonial enterprise, but fewer have sought to penetrate the assumptions of why colonies or empire in its sort of earliest European manifestation was desirable in the first place. You know, why would someone like Robert Johnson, whose quote I read out before, uh, in his tract Nova Britannia, when faced with so much failure, still argue so passionately uh, for the plantation of English people on the side, other side of a vast ocean, a venture that precedent suggests would almost certainly result in bankruptcy or death? So, um, in 1881, John R. Seeley, a famous historian, famously argued that the British Empire was acquired in a fit of absence of mind, that it was essentially a sort of series of bumbling accidents, if you like. Uh, more recently, a Anthony Pagden wrote in his book rather sweepingly that um, uh, European expansion represented the formal ideological expression of a purely instinctual inclination between, towards war and conquest. But to attribute imperial expansion on the scale of the European empires to human nature is in effect to remove ideas from history um, and, uh, and political debates and culture from history as well. Ideas which change and develop under the pressure of new circumstances and uh, challenges. So, like I say, with all this in mind, I'll attempt in this lecture to illustrate the, uh, the context uh, and demonstrate the intellectual changes that took place in the 16th and 17th centuries uh, in Europe. Uh, that made colonial enterprise an attractive solution, among others, to political, economic, and social problems. In short, I'll attempt a short history of the intellectual origins of uh, European colonization. I'll focus on the English case, um, uh, but in the process, we will uh, explore the, uh, the context of European rivalries, the nature of political units, the development of the state, uh, the propagandists for empire, and how trading companies were used as proxies for empire. And hopefully we can do that all in under one hour, but you know, we'll, we'll try our best. Um, so I want to start with a quote by uh, a, a sort of very early Elizabethan writer, Richard Eden. Um, he writes, If such manly courage had not at that time been wanting, it may happily have come into pass that the rich treasury which is now in Spain, in the city of Seville, might long since have been in the Tower of London. So historians have long mused about the figure of Spain uh, enter empire in the eyes of Elizabethan uh, nationalists, especially as a figure of great repulsion manifested in the tyrannical threat of the Spanish Armada, which you've you know, probably heard all about. Uh, uh, the Spanish Leviathan, as it was often uh, described, uh, consistently served as a conceptual and empirical pivot from which English colonial project ideologies developed. So it was impossible for an Elizabethan thinker to con contemplate England's future without considering the implications of the empire. Uh, so fortunately, this group had a, an, they're an extraordinarily literate group um, who, who have become, uh, who, you know, they do, sorry, they produce generous records of their thinking. Um, but these uh, often took the form of prefaces, just translated Spanish writings about the new world and pamphlets uh, that were used to encourage such ventures. So English perceptions of the Spanish Empire manifested themselves in two ways. Firstly, as a point of emulation, 
whetting the English appetite for imperial wealth, power, and glory, and secondly, as an economic, religious, and political threat. So really, to start this all off, we have to unpack what Spain and her empire actually was. So, uh, I mean, you would have heard about this. Who here knows about the Reconquista, what the Reconquista was? Okay, all right. So uh, would you like to uh, explain in brief words what it was? You don't have to, you don't have to, you don't want to. Yeah. I, yeah, so the King Conquistadors, right, did go to South America, as we will learn. The Reconquista specifically refers... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The, 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 the that's right, that's correct. Okay, fantastic. Okay, you, you got it. So, um, uh, Spain doesn't really exist in this period, as we know. What we call Spain was a composite monarchy, a union between two separate kingdoms, Castile and Aragon, which you can see on the map just over here, right? So Aragon is where um, Barcelona is, etc. Castile and, and Leon were you know, kingdoms that joined. So there's a series of Christian kingdoms, um, and uh, they were unified by a marriage between Isabella and Ferdinand. So you might know that these Christian kingdoms had conquered all these Islamic powers in Spain over the previous centuries. By 1492, there was only one Muslim kingdom left, uh, which was extinguished with the surrender of the palace fortress in, in the city of Granada. Uh, the Alhambra, represented uh, in this painting here, was captured, uh, sort of representing the end of the Reconquista. And this painting here shows um, uh, quite dramatically uh, the, uh, uh, the Muslim garrison giving up to uh, Isabella and Ferdinand of, um, you know, of Spain. Uh, so by this moment, uh, what we call Spain had had substantial experience in conquering uh, and forcibly Christianizing swathes of territory. So given this, they were probably the best equipped of the European powers to capitalize on any new world finds. Uh, of course, as you know, Christopher Columbus was able to convince Queen Isabella to fund a small expedition. Uh, critically though, the purpose of this expedition was not necessarily to find new lands to colonize or conquer, its purpose, main purpose, was to find a new Western route uh, to the trade of the fabled uh, uh, wealth of the East. Europeans were well aware of the fact that they were, in, in comparison, relatively poor, right? And most of the attempts uh, to reach out uh, were the exploits of um, adventurers and uh, those small-time uh, people that, you know, uh, wanted to make it big. Um, Columbus had actually gone all around Europe uh, trying to get various monarchs to sponsor his expedition. Um, he went to the Portuguese court to sell his idea. Uh, that, of course, they had already gone around the Cape of Good Hope by that point, uh, going into India and beyond. But he was rightly rebuffed by, his, by Portuguese geographers who told him that India and China were much, much further away than he had calculated. Um, and by the way, nobody ever thought that the world was uh, flat. Uh, they, all they, they knew, everyone's always known, really, since the ancient Egyptians, that it was a sphere. Um, uh, but they, uh, uh, they said, they didn't know the Americas existed, per se, so they, they said China's much further away and it would be an almost impossible journey. Um, so, uh, the Italian adventurer, Columbus, he was from Genoa, set off with a Spanish ship and money to find the wealth of Asia and ran into the Caribbean islands instead. So later expeditions capitalized on this. The conquistadors and Cortes conquered the Aztecs and Pizarro the Inca. They plundered and killed the people of the Americas, bringing back untold amounts of gold and silver. But it was this injection of wealth that destabilized Europe, which would soon also suffer the strains and pains of the Protestant Reformation and its resultant, resultant conflicts. So by 1553, when Richard Eden wrote his piece, um, Spain's American Imperium had been a tangible phenomenon for over half a century. Um, and highly conscious of the English failure to capitalize on the Cabot expedition, so the English actually sent out their own version of Columbus in 1497 and never really done, did anything about it. Um, he chastised his countrymen in, in the dedicatory to his translation, saying that life is better spent in attempts towards the glory of God and commodity of our country. Right? rather than in soft beds at home. Indeed, while the English uh, had been in their soft beds at home, uh, he argued that the Spanish Empire, envisioned as a, an eagle, have so spread his wings that the other poor birds may not speak, seek their prey within the same. 
Importantly, though, he's hinted that it was not yet in every place. And while in England, in years, has decayed, Spain has been enriched, there was still time uh, to sort of do something about it. In the 1580s, Sir Walter Raleigh, who you've probably heard of and you know, seen represented in movies as being sort of like Queen Elizabeth's uh, male consort and sort of lover and all the rest of all these terrible things, um, he argued that Spain's enormous power did not come from trade in sacks of Seville oranges, nor ought from else that Spain or Portugal or any of these provinces produce. And he says quite dramatically, it is his Indian gold that endangers and disturbeth all the nations of Europe. It purchaseth intelligence, um, creepeth into councils, and setteth, setteth bound loyalty at liberty in the greatest monarchies of Europe. Uh, so, um, basically, uh, you had this Spanish Leviathan uh, that was um, uh, encroaching upon the European context. Uh, in 1580, specifically, the crown, as I said earlier, the crowns of Portugal and Spain were combined, bringing both the empires together. But by this point, writers across Europe, from Italy, Germany, France, England, had already accused the Habsburg monarchs um, of seeking monarchia universalis, uh, without restraint, that is, universal monarchy. Indeed, by 1519, Charles V had become not only Holy Roman Emperor, Archduke of Austria, King of Spain, Duke of Burgundy, basically the Netherlands, the Italian wars had ensued the domination of Italy too, and I'll touch on the Italian wars uh, for important reasons uh, later. So for fledgling Protestant realms in the context of the Reformation, like England and the Dutch provinces, um, the threat of political and religious extinction was real. The story to many is, of course, familiar. The English plunged into war with the Spanish Empire in 1585, while uh, Queen Elizabeth was queen. Uh, largely because of English piracy directly sponsored by the Crown and aimed at slowing and indeed capturing the infamous Spanish treasure fleets. And uh, these tensions were brilliant displayed by Kate Blanchett, as you might know, uh, in, uh, Queen, in her sort of Elizabeth the Golden Age, which I, you know, just to sort of uh, get you into the mood, guys, I'll just uh, show a clip from that just so that we can enjoy Kate Blanchett just for a second. Um, so uh, hopefully that link works. Let's see. Okay, it doesn't seem to work. See, the thing with the thing with uh, sort of planning dramatic PowerPoints is that they never actually work in person. Um, okay, let's see if we can just get the video. Yeah. <laughs> Enable content. Maybe that's the problem. Let's try this instead. So you've probably seen this, but it just gives you a sense of uh, the sort of the tension in this period, though this is obviously a dramatization, as you know. Thank <laughs> you. 
that would sweep away your pride. Well, one of the best performances, I think, of uh, Kate Blanchett. Uh, but um, the, the point is, folks, uh, that uh, uh, it, we had this, uh, this tension, this rife tension in Europe between um, the, the Protestant realm, the Catholic realm. And uh, of course, you might know that the Spanish Armada was eventually uh, defeated, mostly by bad weather, uh, in an event that has been time and time again fashioned into a sort of finest hour monument in British history and glorified by later historians and celebrants of uh, British imperialism. Um, so the context of European rivalry and the Spanish precedent of conquest in the New World was clear. Despite this, there was no certainty, especially in the English camp, that overseas ventures would in any way be useful for the maintenance of English independence. So it's easy for us looking back to conclude that this would be the necessary outcome of this intense pressure, but the debates of the 16th century demonstrate otherwise. Europeans were in general highly skeptical of the value of overseas colonization. In 1578, Thomas Nicholas, in his preface to the translation of Lopez de Gamora's history of Cortez's conquest, complained that English, English could not expect the wealth of the Americas so easy, easily. And clearly, if the Spanish experience proved anything, it was, he wrote, that glory and perfect felicity is not gotten but with great pains, travail, and peril and danger of life. Overseas ventures necessarily required long-term uh, commitment, something that merchants were necessarily uh, averse to. Um, this was most evidently manifested in the dramatic failure of the first of Sir Humphrey Gilbert's attempts in 1578 to plant a settlement in Newfoundland. Um, the expedition never got past the coast of Ireland because half his fleet broke away um, upon leaving, leaving Ireland and headed south, the prospect of plundering Spanish ships uh, proving much more attractive and much more easy. Uh, so English merchants desired the opportunity of an overseas empire but were reluctant to throw in their lot with an uncertain English venture. Um, so many sought to conduct business within the Spanish Empire itself, and if this did not translate into piracy, it required merchants to operate within Spain, as foreign uh, trade with the colonies was forbidden. Uh, but England's reassertion of Protestantism on the ascension of Queen Elizabeth uh, would make this very difficult. Merchants like Henry Hawkes and John Frampton uh, were, despite their attempts to conceal their English heritage and profess their Catholic faith, uh, as was required of them, were seized by the Spanish Inquisition uh, and uh, were no longer allowed to operate in the same way that they had been. So the Queen supported Sir John Hawkins' slaving voyages to the Spanish colonies in the 1560s, and this, would hope, this was hoped that it would open up the English trade uh, with the Spanish colonies. And initially they were successful, the Spanish officials overlooked the illegal trade, um, uh, but eventually the sort of uh, trade ban was reinforced and the Spanish uh, attacked and destroyed Hawkins' moored fleet despite reaching a deal with the Viceroy of New Spain. He later attributed this incident to the accustomed treason of the Spanish though, which would never fail to execute where they may have opportunity. Trade with the Spanish colonies was an impossibility, but Hawkins' voyage provided a powerful allegory of Spanish savagery that would feed into what we sort of know and we call uh, the, the black legend, right? Um, so the image of the savage and treacherous Spaniard uh, would have lots of texts to feed it in this period. Uh, you might know a, there was a priest called Bartolomeo de las Casas um, that wrote a scathing indictment on the Spanish treatment of Native Americans uh, called uh, Relacion Brevissima. Um, it was translated into English in 1583 from a French variant produced in the Netherlands. And as the preface remained unchanged for English readers, the work was dedicated as a warning to the provinces of the Low Countries. The fact that the English tra translator felt no need to sort of adapt the preface um, to English audiences showed that they only need to look across the channel to see a looming sort of a example of Spanish oppression. Um, so Las Casas' words by themselves though were pretty terrifying. Uh, for a cautionary tale, uh, he would claim that over 12 million Native Americans had been brutally killed and tortured 
uh, a number that successive English editions um, inflated uh, at every possible um, opportunity. Uh, so Spanish barbarism was so clear uh, to the English uh, that uh, uh, basically the, the, the preface to this volume uh, says that posterity shall hardly think that ever so barbarous and cruel a nation hath been in the world. And virtually every single English uh, writer in this period um, writes with the same sort of anti-Spanish uh, hysteria. Um, so at this point though, I mean, we've got the context of Spain as this threat to England, but I want to delve, delve deeper into the political his theory to understand why many writers would argue that overseas expansion and trade was necessary or desirable. Um, and importantly, to understand why just as many writers argue that colonial enterprise uh, would only further hasten the destruction of the English Commonwealth. Um, so I want to move to the Italian context, actually, because we can explore here where many of these ideas about empire, the state, and colonies came from. So Italy uh, was an important intellectual furnace in this period, uh, before the Portuguese and the Spanish embarked upon their overseas um, ventures in the 16th century. Italy was the richest and most urbanized part of Europe. It was controlled variously by a collection of city-states, republics, and duchies, including the Papal States, the Pope's territory. Rome was the spiritual capital of Europe. Venice harboured the Mediterranean trading empire. Florence and Genoa facilitated powerful banking flame families that financed the monarchies of Europe. This wealth meant that not only were Italian cities home to increasingly fabulous urban landscapes and artistic industries, but it also supported a vibrant intellectual culture obsessed with the resurrection, as they called it, of classical ideas and architecture from ancient Rome and Greece. Uh, what we call, of course, the Renaissance, a somewhat problematic term. Uh, but in 1494, Italy was plunged into a disastrous and destructive series of conflicts um, uh, known as the Italian Wars, which by 1530 had culminated in the end of the Florentine Republic and the violent destruction and sack of the city of Rome. It was during this period that um, some of the most influential political theorists in human history wrote their tracks, namely, one you might know, Niccolo Machiavelli, uh, whose work you've probably read. Uh, what was a political body, they asked? Um, what was its purpose? How could it survive? It's from this context that we actually get the concept of the state, uh, though it's not the state as we understand it today. Uh, really, these concepts were in their infancy. Um, so you might be asking, well, what actually happened? Well, to cut a long story short, there was a fight over the Neapolitan throne, right? Uh, the kingdom just down the bottom here. So Italy is a series of different states. Uh, the Pope excommunicated the Neapolitan king over a dispute over feudal Jews that were meant to be paid to the church and invited the French king to come and invade and take over the kingdom. Uh, so that's exactly what the French king did, marching his hefty armies down the peninsula in a process that destabilised all the Italian city-states, um, most of which had no standing armies and in, relied, like Florence, totally on mercenaries. So by the time Niccolo Machiavelli wrote his famous work in the 15, works in the 1510s and 20s, The Prince, Il Principe, and the 10 books on uh, the, the discourses of, on Livy, um, he was well informed in the quagmire of the Florentine predicament. Uh, he was a first-hand observer, uh, sort of working within the Florentine government throughout this period. Uh, in this period, the Florentine regime changed twice, um, but most of all, Machiavelli lamented the Florentine response to all of this, uh, which he sort of obsesses and complains about, uh, calling it the obsession with the middle way. Um, he argued that everyone in history forever should ought to flee this, um, uh, this sort of middle way philosophy uh, to political theory. Uh, so it was born out of an atmosphere of indecisiveness. It was the side effect of a political culture where in the face of any doubt, debilitation ensued. That was unless it was suppressed by violence, or as it turned out, in this case, the real threat that the, that the French would actually sack the city of Florence. Um, so it was the paralysis uh, that ensued on the arrival of the French ambassador in 1494, requesting passage for the impending French invasion force um, that served as a case in point. Frustrated with Florentine intransigence and delay, um, uh, basically the French um, uh, uh, sort of uh, 
uh, marched in anyway and forced um, Piero de' Medici uh, into what was considered a botched deal, uh, effectively ceding the western half of the Florentine dominion and with it the crowning glory of Florentine power, Pisa. Tempered with the de facto assumption that it would be returned, um, of course, though, Florence would spend the, the next uh, decade attempting to bring Pisa back into Florentine hands. The, this weakness of the Republic was a recurring theme in Florentine dealings, uh, which Machiavelli argued stemmed from the decay um, of relative peace, uh, sort of moral decay under the Medici, which had undermined the city's war readiness, bred effeminacy, and encouraged a greater reliance on ad hoc appointments of mercenary soldiers. Uh, who were notoriously unreliable. Um, so merchant, merch, mercenaries had emptied Florentine treasuries for little benefit, and the Republic had ended up, spending, ended up spending more than was obtained from its acquisitions. Florence was weaker now after this whole crisis, uh, he quipped, uh, than when it had six miles of borders around the city. Um, but critically, uh, and this is what's really important, this is the context that Machiavelli and other writers um, are in when the language of political thought begins to shift in Europe. Um, so in order to understand what's going on here in the language of political thought, I want you to try and forget the idea of the state as, as we know it today, or a country. You know, they simply didn't exist in this period in the way that we understand them anyway. Uh, so borders were not as significant um, as you may think, which may be a shock given that we hear so much about lords and kings fighting over lands and, and all such stuff. The borderlands were usually diffused and spatially heterogeneous places in an older spatial order where people were linked by vassalage rather than places, which means that you often had people throughout Europe living side by side whose allegiance was to different rulers depending on their, sort of, uh, uh, their, their different ethnic groups or religious groups or whatever. Um, it is our assumption that the political city and we'll have an opportunity to discuss, that, discuss this at the end because it, it can seem like uh, pretty dense, but it gives you uh, uh, an understanding of, of what's going on here. It's our modern assumption that the political city and the physical city are one and the same thing that makes it so hard to understand. Um, so the political city being the civitas, the physical city being the territory, um, there's actually a separation of these two concepts in this period, right? Uh, so the civitas was defined by most thinkers as a political body of citizens. It was a legal order of people, but like a human body, it was not inherently tied to a specific piece of land or urban area. It was in a way a sort of floating form of sovereignty, an idea that acknowledged land um, and its uses and its determinative presence but where the civitas was not inalienably bound up in a particular piece of land. So this um, idea was demonstrated by the Aristotelian writer John Case, who in 1588 argued that um, if the place should be changed, it will be another city, but not another commonwealth. Uh, indeed, if the French were driven to the Indies with the same form of administration remaining, that is where France is. Not actually the geographical France, right? Uh, so we're talking about a major shift in the language of politics from the 15th century humanists uh, to the late 16th and early 17th century political philosophers in the age of colonization. The terms of this transformation were described by the historian Maurizio Veroli as a change from politics to reason of state. Where the, the former was the realm of classical civic philosophy where the focus of politics lay in the vivere politico, the political life. This idea was the idea of the civitas as the unit of ultimate human fulfillment, the vector for the good life, sustained by virtuous citizens. It was an idea associated with Italian humanists who were inspired by the writings of Aristotle, but most importantly, Cicero. And what was most important here was that the moral quality of citizens, not how many resources or how rich they were, um, uh, was more, most important. In fact, wealth, and its pursuit was right, widely regarded to be corrupting and destructive to the political body. It was, after all, um, as many writers contended, wealth that led to the destruction of the Roman Empire. Uh, by contrast, reason of state right, um, uh, was where politics had become synonymous 
with the art of maintaining a person's stato at all costs. So this term, lo stato, the, uh, uh, is the origin of the word state, really, um, in political theory. Um, but it means something quite different from literally state. It literally referred to the political position, a state of being of a powerful individual rather than a political entity. It described the patronage networks that an individual like Cosimo de' Medici held within the Florentine Republic. He maintained his own stato, his own political position within the Republican Civitas. As historian Francesco Ricciardini observed, such figures had no need of a city inhabited by generous souls seeking glory, but only those concerned with particular interest. Interests that could be manipulated in favour of the Stato. Hence, where, while the Civitas was a political body of citizens, the Stato was the political position of an actor within this body. Um, so basically, Machiavelli and others started to argue that the moral quality of Florentine citizens ultimately meant diddly squat, you know, in the face of vast uh, sort of foreign armies. Um, so the invasions uh, obviously precipitated the rise of princes across the peninsula and hastened the demise of Republican cities. Um, but it was in this context that the language of politics as classical civic philosophy was usurped by language with the statue of princely figures became synonymous with the civitas itself. So even republics began to adopt the language of the prince, the art of the state, as we call it, for internal in addition to external matters. This transformation in favour of the politics of interest in service of a prince was key in the development of, in the, of the state system in Europe and its associated rise as the homeland of sprawling colonial empires. Machiavelli would argue, it is impossible for a republic or prince to succeed in staying quiet and enjoy its freedom and little borders, for if it will not molest others, it will be molested, and from being molested will arise the wish and the necessity uh, to acquire. This tenant, uh, acquire or be acquired, is a reflection whose importance cannot be underestimated. A rich economic base, therefore, one, even one that breeds internal uh, discord and moral corruption, is the only uh, thing that can facilitate military expansion, which conversely is the only route through which a republic can weaken all other bodies so as to increase its own body. A republic Machiavelli uh, sort of considered could follow the path of Sparta or Venice uh, the sort of static, industrious, pure city, the moral city, but if necessity led it to expand, or if in the, or the winds of fortune compelled it to acquire without the necessary base, Machiavelli uh, said that this would make, make it come to ruin sooner. So imperial expansion was the best metaphorical dike one could build to channel the river fortune, which would most likely, or definitely in the Italian context, um, fortune, that is, bring molestation from another power, even if it stayed to itself and did not molest others. All things are in motion and cannot stay steady, Machiavelli wrote. They write, it must either rise or fall. Um, so, importantly, later writers in the late 16th century, like Giovanni Bittero, an intellectual descendant of Machiavelli, who had become wildly popular in England amongst the propagandists of for empire, would totally redeem uh, the value of wealth in politics. He would argue in his tract, Della Cosa della Grandezza della Città, on the greatness and magnificence of cities, that the power of a ruler uh, came from the multitude of inhabitants under their control and the people's wealth, who by nature, necessity, utility, and most importantly, convenience, gathered in and built cities. Both the public and private wealth of one's subjects was what determined a prince's ability to maintain their state, their political position. So uh, as a forerunner to the language of mercantilist economic self-preservation, and uh, you'll be learning more specifically about this sort of concept of mercantilism as you go through the unit, but Giovanni Bittero uh, emerged as one of the earliest of the proponents of uh, uh, sort of mercantilist thought. Um, large populations, he argued, could only be supported by large space of land to feed them. Wealth could only be encouraged through access to and the development of resources and then the subsequent manufacture for goods, uh, of goods for trade. Industry was key to economic and therefore political 
and military power and could only reach its zenith in labour-dense cities. Marvelling at the economic power of France, he wrote, what power can seem more terrible than the majesty of the kingdom, which is able to feed 15 millions of people? For the abundance of people and plenty of victuals are the strongest sinews of all kingdoms. Wealth was therefore critical to self-preservation, according to this new political philosophy. And if wealth was indeed critical to the survival of one's commonwealth of Stato, then we can see how overseas trade, um, acquiring the fabled wealth of the East, especially in the context of the black legend and the Spanish menace, became a powerful argument. The Dutch humanist, Hugo Grotius, you may have heard of, argued that wealth acquired through colonies and trade would enable the rebellious Dutch provinces in the early 1600s to fight off the Spanish threat. He employed Giovanni Patera's ideas of economic greatness in doing so. Investment in infrastructure increased the economic capacity of the Dutch herbs, as they called it, to defend the new civitas. The pursuit of the wealth of the East Indies would preserve the power of the Stato. Importantly, Grotius sort of developed the idea of the Civitas as a legal person uh, who, just as an individual in the state of nature, was driven by self-preservation and had the right to do what was necessary for survival, to extend and solidify the Stato. If economic power was the basis of the methods necessary to preserve, um, uh, then we can understand the intellectual context where political entities became locked in never-ending battles of self-preservation. Battles which would lead to the aggressive overseas expansion of European powers and contest over the territories they conquered. Uh, of course, the, uh, these regimes, um, republican, princely or otherwise, uh, in the late uh, 1500s and early 1600s, usually lacked the resources to embark upon these great trading enterprises by themselves. Um, and if you're sort of following this philosophy, um, that the greatness of power of a ruler lay in the wealth of his subjects, if private citizens were doing the empire building for you and making themselves rich in the process, then that was good and indeed necessary for the survival of the, the prince or, or, or the commonwealth. So um, this is where all the trading companies come in, right? So you've got the VOC, the Dutch East India Company, uh, you've got uh, the British um, East India Company, you've got the Virginia Company in its earliest manifestation anyway. Um, so they were corporations owned by investors who pooled their collective funds to set up trading posts and settle, uh, settle overseas places. Uh, they were granted charters by monarchs and Republican governments to conduct their business on behalf of the, the states, the stators that they represented. Um, so they were usually acting on behalf of the crown and had to follow uh, the laws of their said country, but were effectively private corporations. Uh, in the debates amongst the early English colonists of the Virginia Company, um, there were those humanists who continued to decry the corruption that these in imperial commercial enterprises would inflict upon the English civitas. So there were debates about the, the value of this that lasted uh, basically as long as the empires lasted them, themselves. Um, uh, they argued that it would bring the same Asiatic corruption that befell ancient Rome, basically. This is what we call a classics of the Seleucian argument. Those propagandists like Richard Hakluyt, Walter Rawley and Robert Johnson, who I quoted at the beginning, who instead argued in favour of such endeavours, spoke in the language of economic reason of state and argued that the wealth creation of these companies would ensure the survival of the English Commonwealth at home. The first successful English settlement was in Jamestown, Virginia, uh, and when, uh, while Virginia, especially in the early years, was not particularly profitable, um, it was the first experiment of a formula which would lead, uh, as uh, you know, Mike explored, um, through slavery and, and other mechanisms, uh, to an empire that by the 19th century uh, dominated large parts of the globe. Um, in truth, the English had not initially been looking to colonise America with settlers on a large scale. Their first applications of the reason of state theory 
um, similar to the Dutch East India Company, was geared mostly towards the creation of new routes to the east. There was an obsession with finding the Northwest Passage over the Americas um, and, and going to China. That way, uh, they would be able to circumvent the Spanish, uh, who controlled, of course, the southern routes, um, both underneath South America and underneath Africa. Uh, of course, there, there is a Northwest. Uh, they were never able to find the route because it was covered by ice. Of course, today, it's all open now, uh, given the climate change or the ice has melted away. And in the summer months, you can very easily go through the Northwest Passage. Um, there was also an attempt to find a Northeast Passage. So that's Northwest Passage here, Northeast Passage over Russia, right? And of course, that was all uh, clonked up with ice. Um, but the English did set up something called the Muscovy Company, um, which was uh, a, a sort of a trading company, just like in the East, uh, East Indies. Of course, um, uh, they weren't able to sort of take control of Russia in, in, in any respect. Um, uh, but uh, there were these trading uh, sort of uh, companies that were operating in all directions, with a sort of philosophy again that the success of these companies would bring wealth back to the homeland. Um, so colonies in North America were initially envisioned as waypoints on a journey, especially after it was determined that there were no Peruvian mines of endless gold and silver to be found there. Um, additionally, by this period anyway, writers had began to argue that the type of slash and dash conquest characterised by Spanish conquest um, was uh, beginning to show its um, consequences. Uh, in his book, Universal Relations, Giovanni Butera argued that the king of Spain's pay is the greater, but the Dutch the better, right? So this, what he meant is that um, Spain at this time was accounted a barren land, he said, uh, but this was not because of any deficiency in the land itself. The ultimate problem was the fact that the monarchs had neglected the development of the land. Um, uh, and. Uh, the New World, of course, had made one city in Spain uh, fabulously rich. Um, he says, the infinite riches of New Spain and Peru are gathered in Seville and making it great in the process. Uh, but gold from the New World um, had sort of uh, stuffed everything up. Um, it had enabled the Spanish crown to buy soldiers, the fiercest soldiers in Europe. Uh, but this inexhaustible gold through its abundance yielded fewer and fewer returns over time, its seeming power distracted from its uh, fatal flaw, uh, inflation, right? So Botero um, uh, said that while it may seem that gold was really the source of Spanish power, and it was in the early days, it was the duties on the commerce in Milan that were worth more to the Catholic king than the mines of the Zacatecas and Jalisco by the late 16th century. Spain was effectively propping up the economies of the rest of Europe, which ultimately provided Spain with all its manufactured goods, and this killed industries at home. It left the Spanish impoverished, so that perversely, Spanish gold had made Spain poorer. Industries were thus the true source of economic wealth and power, and these industries were supported only by vast trading networks, which could be maintained by trading companies, navies, and merchant fleets. So clearly, uh, these debates, these ideas, the specific European context uh, was critical to the creation of the European empires. And while other parts of the world um, most certainly demonstrated and had the capability to do the same, this was not a guarantee that given enough time, they would have done the same. The specifics of these histories show us that humans do indeed have some level of agency, uh, you know, to an extent, that I, there are ideas which, you know, inspire action. Uh, there is always potential, but it requires specific action justified in specific contexts for things as complex as overseas political, political expansion uh, to actually happen. I think that this type of intellectual history is so powerful because it reminds us of the infinite complexity of the phenomenon that we are dealing with and certainly tempers um, uh, broad sweeping arguments on any side about the nature of human societies. So with that, uh, if you have any questions, basically, uh, I'm happy to sort of uh, chat. Uh, I know there's like, there was, a lot of that is quite dense, um, uh, and it might not sort of make sense at first, um, but if you sort of kind of get the gist of the context that I'm talking about, then, you know, that's uh, useful, I think, especially for your, for your end of year, end of semester essay, okay?
So any questions, guys? Yep. Sorry, I, I can't, you have to speak up a little bit. So do you think people appreciate that you're not really Yeah, I mean, there's always the danger with intellectual history that you might be sort of retrospectively creating these uh, uh, useful narratives to explain um, uh, this phenomenon. But um, really, uh, and obviously there is, a, there is a sort of question over whether there's a direct connection between all this debate and what actually happened, you know, because people talk in rooms like this about everything and they might not actually directly link with, uh, you know, with what actually happened. Uh, but um, yes, all the early English colonial propagandists for empire were very much enmeshed in debates about Machiavelli's works. And um, uh, it, it inspired and justified their actions uh, even on the ground in the Virginia Company, I would argue. So I would say that it's uh, in, intensely relevant. Yeah. Um, uh, even though it, you know, it might sound sort of like airy, airy fairy, um, even lawyers in courtrooms would argue over these specific ideas um, uh, from uh, Virginia Company all the way into early colonial New South Wales. Uh, so uh, very relevant indeed. Yeah. All right, well, um, I think that's, uh, what time is it? We've, uh, oh, we're basically towards the end. So yeah. thank you so much, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. It was a pleasure. Thank you. That's right, and that's why I was hoping for it. I was kind of thinking of Ireland today when you were talking as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Ireland's a big part of the story as well. Well, that's what I was thinking. Because uh, you have the London Dairy Company and things like that. And yes, of course. The plantation of us. Yeah. I mean, in many ways, uh, I was 